Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy Jaw, your host, along with Adam Brewer, my co-host. This was a very long week of Ignite, and last week I went to the Gartner Security Conference, so I'm definitely virtual security conferenced out. Did you get any chance to listen to any of the uh, Ignite announcements, Adam? Thank goodness Ignite was only a couple of days as opposed to a full week. I think the idea of splitting it up into two parts is really helpful because it requires so much energy to just kind of sit there and try to absorb as much of that content as possible. And with so many of the sessions being pre-recorded, it comes so fast and furious. So I think that was a great move to split it up, but totally agree. There's there's a lot of mental fatigue coming out of the, the virtual conferences. What I really missed out on is the chance to get that one-on-one time with a lot of the product managers. Last year at Ignite, between the sessions, you get to go up to the presenters and ask them a targeted questions. There were booths and a bunch of the security vendors were also on the floor that you can go up to and ask questions for. So it was really valuable to get that face-to-face time. So I want to mention there was a 10 out of 10 CVE net logon elevation of privileged vulnerability that was patched by Microsoft last month for our domain controllers. And that's something that was mentioned um, as a public service announcement. So I'm just going to mention it quick here that this is something that you need to patch on your domain controllers. This vulnerability allows an attacker with a foothold on your internal network to essentially become a domain admin with one click. And all that's required for a connection is a connection to the domain controller to be possible from an attacker's viewpoint. Microsoft also confirmed that there are attacks in the wild right now. Proof of concepts were released and put onto GitHub, and there are attackers that are using them right now to attack domain controllers. So just as a public service announcement, I'll put the link in the notes. Secura was the company that discovered the vulnerability, and they have released a tool that you can download from GitHub to see if your domain controllers are vulnerable to this. I highly recommend that you read through the blog if you haven't, um, and patch your domain controllers if you haven't done so. Last week, we talked about password protection and password policies. And I had some feedback that some listeners had asked if this was something that they can test to a small group before you roll it out. And while the feature is kind of an on-off feature when you turn it on, there is a feature that you can turn it on in just audit mode. The documentation also states that you, if you have multiple domain controllers, you can just install the agent on a smaller domain controller. That way you can see the passwords that are getting changed on that domain controller. Now, if you have multiple domain controllers, you know, you're not going to see the traffic that is on the ones that don't have the agents installed on for on-prem, but it's one way that you can test the feature while in audit mode, while having the agent on a domain controller. So you can see the load, you can see the traffic, and you can see the benefit of having the password protection. So once you have password protection and users are making better passwords, the question becomes, what's next? How, where should you focus your energy? And I think identity is really the front line of security. Identity is the new control plane, as you'll often hear referenced as well. Right. And so... When you try to protect that identity, you have, you know, your usernames, which are, as we discussed last week, very set common usernames that can be discovered based on what company that you're at. It's usually your first initial last name or first name dot last name at your company's domain. And once you have that password, what's the next step, Adam, when you have a username and password, how do I protect that? If I have the best password possible, I have password protection in place, but is there another thing that I can do to help protect identity? You're really putting the ball on the tee here, but obviously I think what you're getting at is multi-factor authentication. And one thing I always like to mention before we get too deep in the discussion on MFA 
is that MFA is not a strategic direction. MFA is not the holy grail. MFA is a mitigation against the inherent problems with passwords. So I always like to point out that MFA is a stepping stone on the journey really to passwordless, but it's a way until we have passwordless technologies broadly deployed, we can at least strengthen password-based authentication. So always keep that in mind that we're not trying to have the world's best authentication solution. We're trying to make passwords a little bit better. And actually in the case of MFA, a lot better. You'll hear organizations like Microsoft will say that enabling MFA reduces the risk of an account being compromised by 99%. And that's kind of amazing. I don't know a single other security mitigation you can put into place that's reasonable. Obviously, you could disconnect all your devices from networks or crazy stuff like that, but a reasonable mitigation that reduces your amount of risk by that large of a degree I don't think there's any control outside of multi-factor authentication that does something like that. And so, of course, most of the security professionals on this listening to this podcast know what multi-factor authentication is, but it, it can be a variety of things. And, and that's the other something we should think about is people have in their head that multi-factor authentication needs to be something like I get a code generated or texted to me and I put in the code. And actually, there are problems with that methodology, even because there's arguments of out of band versus in band MFA and stuff like that. But broaden your perspective because MFA could even be just something you have in your possession. And there's ways to implement it that don't necessarily involve the user getting a code that they have to put in, but it's still requiring two factors before authentication is granted. So as we discuss it, on the podcast today, just broaden your scope a little bit outside of codes, although that's certainly one methodology available. And Andy, I think one of the things that people get so hung up on is they try to over-engineer their MFA deployments. They make them way too complicated. They assume their users are much less sophisticated than they actually are. And they also make this false assumption that users have never encountered MFA before. And frankly, that's not true. Due to a lot of consumer product implementation, MFA is actually very well known. If you go to a website today, a lot of times they'll ask you for a form of MFA. It could be in the fact that they're going to email you a code and then you have to put that code in after you put in your username and password. It could be that they text you a code, as you mentioned, a text from a code to your phone. It could be a time-based code that you have as a token, a a security token that was issued to you. Could be a soft token, as they're they're called, an app, or could be a a notification that's sent to there. So even consumer products like Apple nowadays, I, I don't even remember turning it on, but now every time I sign into a new Apple device or use my Apple ID on a new device, I get prompted on my iPhone to say, hey, have you logged into this location? After I approve that, I have to put in a six-digit code, and that's considered MFA. And I believe that is pretty baseline for most people who have Apple. What Apple has done that's interesting is they have gated all of their best features today behind MFA. So there's a lot of things that if you want to do them with your Apple ID, or with your Apple device, you must have multi-factor authentication enabled for your Apple ID for that functionality to work. So as one example, you can unlock your Mac simply by wearing your Apple Watch. Your Apple ID must have MFA enabled for that to work. So Apple is really providing a carrot for users to enable MFA because some of their best and newest technologies won't function without it. And I think that's a really clever and interesting approach as well, is they're incenting people to turn on MFA if they want to get access to the best features, as opposed to burying some settings somewhere in some esoteric settings screen that most people outside of security professionals will ever go looking for. So I actually really appreciate Apple's approach and think that's somewhat unique from a consumer products industry perspective. You mentioned that people need to broaden their horizons when they talk about MFA or consider MFA. I would even argue that using a PIN code or biometrics on your phone, Apple or Android, is MFA because that code 
is unique to that device. MFA is multiple factors of authentication. So you have something you know or something you have or something you are. By that code being unique, that's something you know, and you have to have that phone in order for that code to work. That's something you have. If I got a different iPhone, I could set it to a completely different pin and whoever had my phone, even if they knew that code from the previous phone, it will not work with the new one. Yeah, that's exactly what I was getting at. And I was thinking more in terms of Windows Hello for Business or some conditional access policies, which I think we'll get into a little bit farther down the road. But absolutely, using the device as one of your factors is certainly a form of multi-factor authentication. And so you can have scenarios where I have my company-issued Windows PC, and to sign on to that PC, I just do a six-digit numeric PIN. And that pin never expires. There's no history enforced or any of these other complexity or expiration requirements. But A, that pin is never transmitted over the network. And B, that pin is worthless without the combination of device and pin. And so again, to your same point, when I get into a service, when I've signed into my PC through that way, I actually have performed strong authentication. And that's the kind of example, exactly what I was thinking of, where There's a fair number of people who have this idea in their head that unless a code is being generated and I'm plugging it in a prompt, it's not MFA. And that's simply not true. And so that's exactly what I was getting at. And, you know, as as we think through authentication methods available for multi-factor authentication as well, one other point I want to make is that a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned that Microsoft says enabling multi-factor authentication on an account reduces the risk of that account being compromised by 99%. And that does not have an asterisk by it saying that only applies when you use certain methods. There's a lot of discussion and hand-wringing in the security industry that gets focused on things like, oh, you shouldn't use SMS because you can do SIM swaps and that sort of thing. And while that's a valid threat, using that as an excuse to kick the can down the road or not deploy MFA or deliver an experience that is significantly worse for your users is not productive. SMS is better than nothing. And so if the choice is nothing or SMS, you should do SMS every single time. Absolutely, there's some risk involved. And long term, we'd like to walk away from those. And again, that's where I talk to. MFA is not a strategic direction. It's mitigation. And so as opposed to arguing about how we're going to do MFA or the nitty gritty details of it, let's focus all of those efforts on getting to a true strategic direction. And that's passwordless. I just think there gets way too much hung up on which methodologies to use. The only one I would say straight up don't use is security questions. But Everyone knows that already because they're just so weak and ineffective and it's it's not a something that only one person knows in a lot of cases or it's something you can look up. Anyhow, I don't want to get off topic, but that's just kind of my little soapbox thing is, is people getting hung up on things like SIM swapping and SMS and all of that. If the choice is between nothing and, and using SMS, 100% of the time you should deploy with SMS. I can't remember who the quote is attributed to, but... In security, we often chase this perfection, and perfect is the enemy of good. And you can have good security with MFA turned on an SMS, but obviously it's not perfect because there are proven cases where SMS codes can be intercepted. And But that's not to say, like you said, just turning on MFA and having that SMS multi-factor is better security than not having it turned on at all. So I think it's important to remember that perfect will never happen, most likely, because there's always going to be vulnerabilities, and that shouldn't stop you from doing good security. So as a concept, I think we can agree because of the implementations of different consumer products these days that multi-factor authentication is something that a lot of consumers are familiar with as a concept, even if they don't understand the security benefits. And when it comes to enterprise implementation, It's something that security professionals at their companies should turn on and implement right away. I also want to mention that this is the cloud-enabled type accounts. We can get into on-prem AD security in later episodes, but for 
any type of cloud sync, especially for Azure AD or any other IDP that you may use, they should have MFA and something called single sign-on as features of that IDP. And if they don't, I would be very concerned in using that IDP, Identity Provider IDP. If you have Microsoft as just O365, there's basic MFA built in as you progress through their different licensing SKUs, I should say. E3, you get something called conditional access, and then E5, you get something else called risk-based conditional access. But basic MFA is included in the base product. MFA is included both from a kind of old school perspective of turn on MFA and somebody gets prompted every single time. There's also a, a newer offering called security defaults, and that makes a certain baseline of security capabilities available to every customer, regardless of what license they own. And so while that might turn on more frequent MFA prompts for administrators or people who hold higher levels of privilege, for all users, they will become subject to risk-based conditional access controls, where they'll be prompted if there's unfamiliar sign-in properties or an unfamiliar location or using a Tor browser and all integrated with the Microsoft Authenticator app. That has become something that Microsoft gives away to every customer. And then as you step up into some of the higher SKUs, what you get is the ability to be more granular and more targeted. Those, those base rules are just kind of on or off. Do you want it or not? If you want to be able to get more specific about, well, I want to do it in this case, but not this case, that's where you, you have to step up into the premium licensing in order to do. Other IDPs that I've had experience with are very similar to the basic MFA, on or off. And so if you're signing into that account, you're going to get prompted for MFA. As a user, that can be annoying, right? Like if you're prompted for MFA, every single time I, I log into a session for that browser and I get prompted, it almost hinders me and it, it can be annoying. And so some IDPs allow you to exclude MFA, as we talked about last week, by using IP addresses or subnets as a condition that will exclude from MFA. There are obviously some benefits from a user experience, but from a security experience, security mindset, we talked about last week where you're doing that and it actually degradates your security. I would argue that not only would writing a static rule to bypass MFA reduce your security, but I would argue that prompting users all the time is bad security as well, and here's why. If I make my users fill out an authentication prompt all the time, and I would say all the time is more frequently than once a week is too much. Actually, if we really want to go down that rabbit hole, I, I would say even less than that is still too much. But anyhow, if I'm prompting users to do authentication all of the time, what I am really doing is I'm training my users to respond to Pavlovian conditioning, where as opposed to Pavlov ringing the bell and his dog salivating, it's users see a prompt and they put in their username and password almost subconsciously without considering what they're doing. So what you've really done by making your users authenticate all the time is you have trained them to be excellent at responding to phishing attacks. And that is not productive. And so what happens is people get this idea in their head that the only way I can ensure that somebody should still be in a system is if I'm prompting them to authenticate. But what they're failing to understand is that in a lot of modern IDPs, and especially in Azure Active Directory, the process of authentication and authorization have been separated and have been for some time. So once I have validated that you are indeed Andy Jaw, I don't need to keep checking. Are you still Andy Jaw? Are you sure you're still Andy Jaw? The question becomes, should Andy still be allowed to get to this thing? And in Azure AD, that happens at a minimum once an hour. And Microsoft is starting to test technology that can do that ongoing authorization checking even more frequently. So it is not a requirement to make Andy fill out his username and password and MFA all the time just to ensure he should still be allowed on this thing. I can do that without prompting him. And so... What I've heard people from Microsoft say, and I like this a lot, is that users should only be prompted to do their username, password, and MFA once per user, per device, per password reset. 
If your password reset policy is 90 days or 180 days, that is, and I'm on the same device doing the same thing, I should only be prompted to sign into my Outlook, for example, once every 180 days. So once you've authenticated that one time on day one Mm -hmm. and you've provided your multi-factor authentication, we're going to leave that until the next password reset before you have to authenticate again and then prompt you for the MFA, correct? Correct. That's A, what Microsoft advocates for, and B, that is the default behavior of Azure Active Directory. You would actually have to take action in order to make it prompt users more frequently because that's the default behavior. So once we've decided we're going to move forward with MFA, this is something that as a company we want to do. How do we go about implementing it at a company? What's the best method or steps that a security professional or project manager can implement if MFA at a large company? You know what the worst method is? Doing it by the seat of your pants after a breach. And so... Just turning it on. <laughs> right. Well, but a lot of organizations, that's how MFA gets deployed. And that doesn't sound great, and nor should it. And so that should influence every decision you make. This is this should be a rush at this point. If you don't have MFA on in 2020, this should be the number one highest priority project you're doing. Again, 99% mitigation. That's a number senior leadership understands, and they understand well. And so no matter how much they want to bellyache about it being inconvenient or destroying productivity, and you can talk about all the things we've talked about on this podcast, like other implementation methods, prompting infrequently. The fact is you need to do it and you need to prioritize it. So I say that somewhat in a snarky fashion, just to reiterate that a lot of organizations build up all of these great project plans over multi-month projects and these great communication plans and everything. And then they're all thrown in the shredder because they end up deploying it in a very rushed fashion. And so however you're doing your planning, make sure that there's a significant amount of urgency in what you're trying to do. Most IDPs, and here's some just basic steps, will allow you to deploy MFA that's gated to a specific security group so you can test it with a pilot group. I recommend making the factors flexible that you're going to allow the user to enroll in. We didn't dive into specific factors on what are secure or not. If you're in the security space, you know there are some factors that are more secure than others. But make them flexible enough that the user is not going to be hindered. Surprising as it is, not everybody has a smartphone today. So forcing it to go through an app can be difficult. And there may be folks who are not able to do that. Now, if you as a company, you're able to provide them with a separate method, say a a phone that the company is going to pay for, or you want to implement it through a security key, uh, a FIDO key, or you allow them to do texting. Some IDPs allow a phone call through like an office phone or any phone number, and you get a, a vocal code through the, the voice. So, you know, make sure that the factors are flexible for the users. One of the things I do like about Azure AD's multi-factor authentication is that it allows you to enroll multiple factors and then sometimes you can even have policies to say the user will be prompted for more than one factor in certain instances. Is that correct, Adam? The user, it'll default to a user's primary method, but then they can say, I don't have this phone with me or that's not good for me right now and pick a different one. And so it gives the user flexibility in that There's always the concern about, well, I forgot my phone at home scenario, which is legit. Give them another way they can solve the challenge. Right. And definitely for your privileged accounts, your admins, they should be the folks who are enabled first if you needed to gate it to your deployment to a specific group. One thing I want to say on that concept of enabling your admins for MFA first is yes, from a perspective of security bang for your buck, it's going to give you the most win because they're highly sensitive accounts and can do really, really bad things. Totally agree with that. However, the the one other thing I want to point out is don't get so hung up on admin accounts 
where sometimes they're complicated or they're doing weird things, they're running scripts with them or automation, if you can't make MFA work in all the use cases right away. And don't let that hold up the rest of your deployment. In fact, a lot of your rank and file users are going to be easier to deploy MFA on because they have simpler use cases. So don't let that be a blocker if you kind of get into your project management terminology. Don't let that be a critical path that blocks the whole project. You can run a parallel effort to enable, say, what I would call super users, kind of your power users from your organization that they're not in IT, but they're very technical. Get them involved with the MFA deployment and enable them because they might be easier to get some real world experience on how that's going to work for your actual majority of your organization. Focusing just on IT and just on admins sometimes can backfire because they just have so many more complicated use cases and scenarios. And definitely one part to make any type of IT project successful is user education. Definitely for multi-factor authentication deployment, have some sort of user communication, be ready to walk them through that so that they are prepared and can enroll. A lot of IDPs have the instructions pop up right away and it's usually pretty simple to enroll. Not everyone is familiar with scanning a QR code for an authentication app. So, you know, make those factors flexible and have some user education to walk them through the enrollment process. On user education, one thing I always like to point out is that when you buy a new iPhone, does a manual come in the box? And the answer to that is no. There's a small little pamphlet fold out thing that walks through basic use cases and how to get started. But other than that, there's the assumption that the product is easy enough to use that the best way to learn it is to just go through it. And I think this is a Achilles heel of many an IT project where there's this effort to document absolutely every inch of the tool and every use case in every scenario. And then you get this documentation that looks like the Encyclopedia Britannica as opposed to making it look simple and accessible. So there is a a balance here where you will scare users and make them think something is more complicated than it is by over-documenting and over-communicating on it. There's a balance to be had here, and I think a lot of training departments and a lot of organizations go way too far in the wrong direction and actually contribute to user anxiety and concern with a new tool. The most part, any good IDP is going to be really friendly, known to be user-facing when it's walking users through enrollment, and it's going to tell them exactly what to do. The instructions are on the screen. There shouldn't be a need for a significant amount of additional documentation. So totally agree on user education from the perspective of we're turning this on on this date, so be prepared. This is going to happen. That's good to avoid a mass amount of calls to your help desk. But at the same time, don't make this where users have to go through mandatory training. Don't write documentation that's 300 pages long. There's a balancing act here. And and candidly, I think a lot of organizations don't get it right. I feel like you've been sitting in on some of my project that <laughs> that have been asking me to document every little step and, and every instance that uh, users may encounter. What message does it send, right? We need to consider that. We need to think about that. And when documentation is reams and reams of paper, it sends the wrong message. It says, this is complicated. This is hard. If we say, this is super easy. You just go to the website and just do what it says. It'll walk you through the whole thing. No problem. That's going to help users be more confident that they can figure it out on their own. And in all honesty, we need to also address the fact that organizational makeup and generational makeup is shifting rapidly. As boomers are starting to retire more and more and more, people have this mindset that millennials are still fresh out of college uh, people. Millennials have mortgages. Millennials have children. The people that grew up with technology are becoming the majority of your organization. So we don't need to create all this documentation for these niche groups of, of your employee base anymore. The assumption should be that the majority of your employees are technical, grew up with technology, know how it works. And if we treat them with that kind of respect, they will have more success in return. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox, but this is kind of a passionate uh, subject for me as well. It's a great conversation. That's all the time we're going to have this week. Next week, we'll dive into a little bit more about 
conditional access and risk-based conditional access, which I think is kind of the holy grail when it comes to identity protection. If you take anything away from this conversation, if you haven't enabled MFA in your organization, this should be the number one priority for you as a project. Leave us a voice message or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn. Our information is in the show notes. If there's a security topic you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on or feedback, we'd love to hear from you guys. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.